yeah, I got the juice. Big game cool, make them look like cool. Always play cool, that's the biggest rule. Fuck it, what they doing, keep on doing. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Fielder's Choice Podcast here on the Heavy Hitter Network. My name is Mario Romanelli, and I'm your host. Tonight, we will be previewing the 2020 season for the Boston Red Sox. So uh, we're going to dig into uh, basically a little bit of what happened last year, the record. Uh, of course, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the um, trouble they got themselves into in the offseason with the cheating scandal, fallout from that. But what I really want to talk about is what 2020 is looking like for this team. Uh, who are some of the players they lost? Who are some of the players they added? Uh, what does the rotation look like? A couple prospects that they've got. And uh, ultimately where I believe they will finish. So uh, we'll, before we get into that, I just want to touch on uh, some news that came out today. Uh, kind of a development from the Houston Astros cheating scandal. Which, uh, of course, the Astros had to kind of sit in front of the media and admit to what they did. And I've got some quotes here, just some random quotes that I uh, picked out that I just wanted to share with you guys in case you weren't able to see that video yet. Um, we'll start with Jim Crane, of course, the owner of the Houston Astros. Uh, his quote was, we don't endorse the actions that took place. We've apologized. It's been tough on the team, tough on the city, and tough on the nation. I don't disagree with that. The only thing we can do is sit here and say we're sorry. We're going to move forward in a positive way. You can count on us to be a positive force in delivering that message. Uh, Josh Riddick, the uh, outfielder for the Houston Astros, said, We were a good baseball team, and we still are a good team. It was one of those unfortunate things. We didn't make the best judgment call. It's a thing we have to deal with right now. We take full responsibility for it. We feel bad. We're sorry for it. We have to move forward. We have, we move forward. We win. And that will be the best thing for us, which is something I said in the uh, Houston Astros show. If you haven't watched that yet, I said that the best way for them to get out of this mess is to go out there and win. And, uh, Josh Reddick kind of saying those same comments there. Uh, Jose Altuve, of course, the shortstop and really the face of the franchise, I think. Uh, some might say Correa, but I think Altuve, being the senior player there, probably even more so. Uh, he said um, he was asked if the team knew what was what it was doing was wrong, and his answer was, yeah, kind of. That's why we feel bad. I'm not going to say to you it was good, it was wrong, we feel bad, we feel remorse. Uh, the impact on the fans and the impact on the game, we feel bad. Uh, so that was Altuve. Uh, Correa, Carlos Correa, the shortstop, of course, uh, said the sign-stealing scheme was limited to mostly the regular season in 2017. He said it was hard to accomplish during the playoffs, including the World Series, because of crowd noise and the paranoia over sign-stealing going on around the league. And this comment here kind of really bothered me because he admits like that there was tons of paranoia from the other teams about what they were doing. So, I mean... They cannot claim any kind of, you know, ignorance to, well, we weren't sure if it was wrong or, and, and I haven't heard them say that, but boy, when you're talking about, you know, well, we couldn't do our cheating because the crowd noise or, you know, people were actually starting to pay attention and, and believing that we were. And that still didn't make any of these players feel wrong. Like, man, what we're doing is wrong. Somebody's got to, you know, we just got to stop this. It's just kind of really, really shameful when you read it like that. And there's a comment later that I'll read, too, that kind of also dives into they had some roadblocks, and they still broke right through those and still continue to do it. And uh, so we'll get into that one later. Um, what was the other comment here? Uh, Rob Manfred, the commissioner, of course, of baseball, uh, he had a quote here. He said, we have an obligation as a league to be as transparent as possible, to get the facts out, there so that our fans understand what happened. I think they need to make a judgment as to how those facts impacted the outcome of the games. Again, you know, just being very transparent, trying to get the information out there, because if they hide anything in this investigation, I mean, you're doing double damage to the fans, in the fans' opinion. 
So you might as well just be open, honest, tell them what you know, tell them what you, you know, how long it went on. And that's really all you can do at this point. I mean, the, the crime's been committed. So now it's the, the rebuild from the crime of how you handle it. Uh, Alex Bregman, one of my favorite players, uh, he came out with a quote and he just said, I'm really sorry about the choices that were made by my team, by the organization, and by me. I've learned from this and I hope to gain the true trust of baseball fans. I would also like to thank the Astros fans for all their support. We as a team are totally focused on moving forward to the 2020 season. Uh, El Tuve had another quote. It said, we had a great team meeting last night. I want to say that the whole Astros organization and the team feel bad about what happened in 2017. We especially feel remorse for the impact on our fans and the game of baseball. Our team is determined to move forward to play with intensity and to bring back a championship to Houston in 2020. And there's something that I've, in all these quotes, as I was, you know, putting this together, there was something that stood out to me. I don't know if it stood out to you yet, but we'll keep reading a few more and then I'll let you know kind of what I'm getting out of all these quotes. Uh, Justin Verlander, of course, former player for my Tigers, um, who was traded to the Astros in August of 2017. Uh, he came out with his quote. He said, I can't go back. I can't reverse my decision. I wish I had said more, and I didn't, and for that I'm sorry. We crossed a boundary, we broke the rules, and we're sorry. And, you know, Justin Verlander, again, somebody that's been very vocal about cheaters in the past and, you know, doing it the right way, and then for him to be tied up into this and then that to be his thing of, you know, I wish I would have done more, I'm sorry. I mean, it's it's not acceptable because when you put yourself on that kind of, you know, platform to, I don't want to say be holier than thou, but just to, to come out against these other players that you thought have cheated in the past and then not have the guts. I mean, he's one of the leaders on that team for sure. If his voice would have been heard, if he would have gone to somebody and said, look, this is enough, I think it would have got, carried some weight. But instead, you know, he, he stands behind behind this apology, I guess, if you want to call it, and, and just, you know, I don't know. It's just, again, it's, it's just shameful. It's really shameful. Um, so there's two more quotes, but the one thing that I did want to mention that I, I kind of connected to all of these, if you notice, none of the players had mentioned how, hey, we're sorry it cost, uh, you know, our general manager his job, our manager his job. I mean, to me, they kind of bit the bullet for this, and and as they should, I mean, they were the leadership on this, but in the MLB report, it was uh, it's reported that the scheme was player driven, and at one point, or excuse me, at two incidents, AJ Hinch actually smashed a monitor set up near the dugout to protest against what was happening. The players didn't get the message though, and it didn't stop the operation until some point in the 2018 season. The reporter said. So I mean, AJ Hinch came out. He you know he was very. Uh, I guess very forthright with that he didn't agree with what they were doing. Now, again, as his, as being the leader of this team, there were ways he probably could have handled this too to be even more out there. But the fact that he's literally smashing monitors to get his point across that he's not, you know, not supporting this and the players still just continue to do it, like, it, it just, it's so bad because there were so many things that should have had them, you know, if they would have just cheated two games, five games, ten games, you know, and then Hinch breaks the TV and they're like, wow, yeah, you know, we, we got to figure this out. We got our manager mad at us, you know. Uh, once the rumors got going around the MLB, you know, people are starting to talk about us. This is wrong. And they never, never did it. And that's shameful. So the last quote I got here was from Lance McCullers, who was a pitcher for the Houston Astros. And he sums it up pretty much exactly what it's going to be in 2020 for this team. He said, the road is going to be hostile. That's everybody's right to feel that way. That's probably the best quote of them all. That's probably the best quote of them all. Because I don't want to hear I'm sorry. Because you're only sorry that you got caught. Because you'd probably still be doing it if you didn't. And you know what? That's just, that's the best quote of all. The road is going to be hostile. Absolutely it is. And it should be. 
And that's everybody's right to feel that way. And again, Lance McCullers is a pitcher. And that's really who was being cheated against were the pitchers in MLB. So being a Houston Astros pitcher, I guess, I don't know how that, how you feel about this whole thing. You know, it's gotta be, it's gotta be hard. It's gotta be very hard to, uh, support it. And I get, you know, when you're on a team, you don't want to be the one that throws the rest of the guys under the bus. You're a team. You're supposed to, you know, get through this, but something like this, I think somebody had to step up at some point and do something about it. And the fact they didn't, now they leave themselves very vulnerable to abuse on the road for sure. So that's, uh, that's the part of it I wanted to talk about with you guys first on that. Um, another report coming out today, not a report, a news story just on MLB. You can go read it, but it just says, you know, who's the most high powered offense coming into the season. Um, and it looked like I kind of just glanced at it real quick while I was getting ready. It looks like they're saying the Minnesota Twins. I'm not sure I agree with that, but I'll dig into it, and maybe the Twins will be the next team I break down. I don't know. I don't really do this in any certain order. I just kind of – I knew I wanted to get Houston and Boston out of the way because of the uh, cheating scandal over the offseason. I don't want to waste a lot of time getting to those two teams, get them out of the way, and then move on to the, the more positive stories. But – uh this one might cause some controversy because I don't know where a lot of people stand on the Red Sox, but you're about ready to hear what I do. So with that being said, let's get into it. So last season, the Boston Red Sox finished third place in the American League East. They had a record of 84 and 78. They were behind the Tampa Bay Rays and, of course, the New York Yankees. Those are two very high-powered teams. So Boston finishing above 500. But uh, not in the spot where the Boston Red Sox really would like to finish, uh, you know, with their with their history. Um, they did think they had some good things going, though. They had Alex Cora as their manager. They felt good about him. Um, some young players, all that. But this was not their season. And, again, two much better teams, in my opinion, finished above them. So, with that being said, we moved to, of course, the cheating scandal, all the uh, information that came out on that which led to Alex Cora being fired, Ron Renneke now being brought in. Again, I kind of already ran through this on the uh, Houston Astro show, so I'm not going to talk much about it here. Um, it's I, I think, again, Ron Renneke, right decision to go with him to kind of get this thing somewhat under control, and uh, and we'll see where that goes. But Ron Renneke, again, just a, a guy that I think can take this team – get the media out of their face and let them just worry about baseball at this point. And really with the, with the Alex Cora being gone and I mean, they're still doing the investigation on the Red Sox. I don't know if the Red Sox were, I don't know what I would say. I don't know if they cheated as badly. I mean, if they cheated at all, it's bad, but I don't know if they did it for as long of a time and we'll just, we'll have to wait for the reports to come out. I really don't want to guess or, uh, you know, throw any guesses or assumptions out there that wouldn't be fair. So I will wait for the report to come out. But now I am hearing, I heard yesterday on the uh, radio, on XM Radio, MLB's channel, that now they're saying Ron Renneke might be wrapped up in this thing. So it'd be really silly if it comes out that Ron Renneke was involved to where now they have to fire him and then bring in another manager. It would be a really bad look for the Red Sox. I mean, I get the seasons, you know, spring training's here, and you've got to get a coach in the position. But why in the world would you go with Ron Renneke if there's any chance that he was involved? And you've got to, you've got to, you know, once they said it, I kind of got thinking about it. And I was like, he's the bench coach for Alex Cora. How wouldn't he know if there was some cheating going on? It'd be really hard for me to believe that Alex Cora was doing this and Ron Renneke had no idea. So now I don't know. So, again, I'll wait for the report to come out, see what they say. But if Ron Renneke is part of this, then Boston just looks completely horrible on this whole idea. And just, I mean, they could have gone on and grabbed anybody outside the organization that you knew wouldn't be tied to this. And then Ron Renneke could have been their bench coach had, you know, he not come up in the investigation. But the fact that they're still not 100% sure if he was part of this, and now you've just named him your interim manager, it would not look good for the Red Sox. So 
we'll wait. We'll see how that all pans out, but uh, that would be a very embarrassing thing. So the Red Sox did lose some players in the offseason, some very important ones in my opinion, and some not so important. So we'll run through them real quick. I'm not going to touch on, I'm not going to break every one of them down. Let's go through some of them that I don't think are a huge impact. I mean, Stephen Wright was released. Chris Owings uh, was a free agent. He signed with Colorado. Steve Pierce, free agent, still hasn't signed with anybody. And Steve Pierce, you know, when he was with Baltimore, he's kind of that big slugger bat, but he just never really evolved into anything. And I, I there for a while, I thought he might be a really decent player, but he just never evolved. Uh, Brock Holt, he also is now a free agent. Brock Holt's kind of a surprising, I guess, let go by the Red Sox for me because he was at least a versatile player on the field that you could play in a multiple positions. Uh, he played a lot of second base for them. Actually appeared in 87 games, hit 297. So, I mean, he was a good player. Um, but he, I, I, I felt like he had value just from the versatility part. Just, a, you know, the utility role that he played at times. I thought he was a good good bat. But they chose not to re-sign him. So he is currently sitting there uh, if they want to bring him in, I guess. Uh, Andrew Kashner, another one. Just never, never really evolved for the Red Sox, which, you know, he, to me, he was always a little overrated anyways, but uh, two wins, five losses, 620 ERA, so just did not have it for the Red Sox. And now we go into Rick Porcello. Rick Porcello now, who, of course, signed with the Mets, he actually, to me, that's a big loss for the Red Sox. Um 14 and 12 records, so you can say you had 12 losses for, that was, I don't think that was really, I think that was more tough luck on Rick Porcello and a lot of that. Um, a 5.52 ERA, a little high for Rick Porcello's pass, but Rick Porcello, and as we get to the bullpen, or uh, the rotation later on the show, they could have used Rick Porcello in that rotation, for sure. So, that's a big loss in my opinion. I mean, he proved he could play in Boston, you know, you need him against the Yankees. You need him against Tampa Bay. And um, I just, to me, that's a surprise. I mean, Boston's not a team that really is trying to dump contracts or, you know, are scared to spend money. And had they gone out and gotten, you know, some better pitching that was an upgrade to Rick Porcello, then by all means I would have, you know, supported this move. But now that we're at spring training and you kind of see what the Red Sox did, it's leaving me wondering, you know, why, where, how, how did we come to this decision to not bring Rick Porcello back? So, and who knows, maybe it was Rick Porcello. You know, maybe Rick Porcello said, I want to be a free agent, I want to test the waters. He got a better deal from the Mets, and then Boston, you know, was left standing there. Could be, but to me, if I'm Boston, I'm not letting him get away. Uh, Jolice Chassin. Also elected to go free agent route. He ended up with the Minnesota Twins. Uh, not a huge loss. I mean, he'll go out there, he'll give you innings, but had an ERA over seven and just really just had a rough season. So I'm not really worried about them losing Jalice uh, Chassin. Sandy Leone was traded to Cleveland. Uh, he was basically a backup catcher, so you can find those. Anytime you want, really. Um, they did make some signings and some trades that I do feel pretty positive about. So I'll go over those real quick. Uh, they signed free agent shortstop Jose Peraza. He actually played with the Reds last year. We'll get more into him a little bit later when I go through the roster. They also signed left-handed pitcher Martin Perez from the Twins in 2019. And then they signed the backup catcher. So, of course, I just said to get rid of Sandy Leon. It's easy to pick up another one. They did. Kevin Ploiecki. Ploiecki, not monster numbers for Cleveland last year. But backup catcher really don't need monster numbers. You're not looking for a miracle with a backup catcher. It's literally just give your starter a rest day. That's, I mean, if you get a bomb for me, cool. But you're really not asking that backup catcher to be anything special. So, those are easy, that's what I say, those are easy to rotate in. You, you get rid of one, you can find one on the scrap heap and, and plug them in and play. So, 
That's basically what Kevin Plowicki is going to do for the, the Red Sox this year. Um, they did trade second baseman Santos to Miami for Austin Bryce, a pitcher, right-handed pitcher. Uh, Sam Davis they traded to the Rangers, which is funny because they actually had uh, Sam Travis. They just kind of, you know, released him, and he cleared waivers. When he goes back to Boston, and now Texas wants to trade for him, and it's like, if you wanted him, why don't you take him when he was sitting on waivers? But uh, they didn't, so then they ended up having to give up left-handed pitcher Jeffrey Springs. Not going to act like I know anything about Jeffrey Springs. I don't. Um, but it's a left-handed arm, so in baseball, you know, you can never get too many lefties to to throw the ball for you. So I guess I'll I'll say that much about it. Um, they did trade catcher John Nunez to the Tigers for Matt Hall. Um, again, not a blockbuster trade. I'm not going to waste too much time on that. And then the blockbuster trade was, of course, Mookie Betts and David Price and a little bit of cash going to the Dodgers for Alex Verdugo. Uh, Connor Wong and Jeter Downs. So I do have a little bit more to say about uh, Alex Verdugo and Jeter Downs a little bit later in the show. But overall, that uh, that trade was the one of the season that the Boston Red Sox made. So when you really look at their off season and you say, okay, what happened to this team? Well, big let goes was Rick Porcello, in my opinion. And now you let go of David Price. And now you let go of Mookie Betts. And what did you get in return? Well, as I looked into them, because, you know, last show I admitted, I, I didn't know a lot about these names that they got back. Um, Verdugo, now I do see. And I don't see a lot of West Coast games. You know, it's hard for me to see. I don't see as many West Coast games as I do East Coast games because I'm, you know, central. So, and I was still on my other shift at work, too. So it just made it very hard. But now that I'm back, I'll, I'll definitely, uh, probably be ordering the baseball package again and get more West Coast, uh, information there. But Verdugo does look promising. I'll say that real quick. But to me, that, that's, it's not a good offseason if you're a Red Sox fan. You lost more than you got back for sure. A hundred percent. Uh, you lost more than you got back. So you are a worse team than you were last year, in my opinion. And that's why I say this could be, I might make some people mad uh, tonight with this, but to me, I don't. It would be very hard for me to hear a, a disagreement with the fact that anybody feels like this team is better right now from where they were in September of last year. I mean, we can be mad about how they finished last year, but they did, did nothing to upgrade this team. So as far as rotation, um, Chris Sale. Looks like he's going to be your ace. We'll get into him later. We'll get into all these guys later. But Chris Hill's going to be your ace. Eduardo Rodriguez, probably at your number two. Martin Perez, your number three. Nathan Avaldi, I would imagine four. And Hector Velasquez is what MLB is showing right now. That could change. It sounds like they're not really locked into that number five spot yet. But I'll tell you what, after going through the roster, I don't see much else that I would be putting in that five spot. So I think you almost are, I think it will be Hector. We'll see. Maybe I'm wrong on that. Um, but again, a lot of spring training yet to go. We're just getting started. So there's always those guys that, you know, crop up and then start doing something really good and kind of surprise you. So uh, we'll see. We'll see what happens there. But Chris Sale, real quick for me, started 25 games last year. 6 and 11 record, 440 ERA. This guy just can't stay healthy, though. I mean, if I got an ace, a true ace, I need a guy that's taking that ball every day that I need him to. And Chris Sale, for the longest time, to me, has been overrated. Um, he had his peaks, you know, he had his peaks, but to me, his career is filled with more valleys than peaks. And so for the Boston Red Sox, this is a race. I mean, I'm not going to dispute that he's probably the best pitcher they've got. But can I consistently write him in to take the ball every day and, you know, put out a good performance every day? You really can't with this guy. He's he's very inconsistent and very much an injury risk. So if he can put it all together, then he's got a chance to be a Cy Young winner. I just, you barely, you rarely, rarely see it from him anymore. And the older he gets, I think he's going to be, become more brittle than he already has been in his career. 
So Chris Sale to me, I'm not I'm not a Chris Sale fan. Um, nothing personal, just as far as you know what he brings to the table, I, I'm not a fan of. So Chris Sale's are the one. Uh, I said Eduardo Rodriguez, the 26-year-old lefty, he will be your number two last year. Uh, 19 and 6, 381 ERA, appeared in 34 games, pitched over 200 innings. And this guy's, you know, actually he might be my ace. If I really had to pick one, he might be my ace. Just because age wise, and he's got a really good changeup, and he's really developed a cutter. So, I mean, he's got three stellar pitches. He's got his fastball, his changeup. And the cutter that he started throwing in 2018, um, I saw where in like 2017 he threw like only 80 of these cutters, and then he developed it in 2018 and really started throwing it, and then he threw it, threw it even more last season. So that's really developing into a pitch for him. So actually, Eduardo might be your best bet as, as far as the pitching goes. Um, so it would be nice to see how he develops this year uh, with with that cutter. Uh, Martin Perez, I mentioned him. He went 10 and 7 with the Twins last year, which the Twins had a good team. So 10 and 7. 512 ERA, though. Really, really high. Uh, pitched 165 in the third innings. Uh, struck out about 7.35 was the number in, on an average of nine innings. So not bad, but the Red Sox don't believe that much in him because they only gave him a one year deal. So. It's got an option on it, but he's got to prove out that he's worth that option. And, again, it kind of, to me, I'm, I'm a little confused about what the Red Sox did in the offseason. I, I, like I would like to talk to them about where do they think they are? Who do they think they are right now? What's their identity as a team? Are they a team on the rise? Are they a team rebuilding? Are they a team trying to free contracts up? I don't know what they're doing, really, because, again, they're, they didn't, Return to the investment that they put out this season. They just, they, they gave away more than they got back. Potential in these guys that they got in the Mookie Betts trade, but just straight up right now today we're talking, it's, it's, there's not, they did not get the replacement they needed, in my opinion. Nathan Avaldi. Nathan Avaldi kind of like Chris Sale to me. Just injury prone, never really has become the guy. Um, he did have a good season with the Yankees, uh, where I want to say he got like 15 wins, I want to say. That was his record for his for his career. Um, I got the note right here. Let me look it up because I don't want to say it wrong. But, um, yeah, in his eight MLB seasons, he's only posted double-digit wins once. And that was 2015 with the Yankees. So, I mean, he's been around a while now. And, you know, you always heard stuff about Nathan Avaldi, but again, he's just, he can't stay healthy. Um, 29 years old now, so you don't know what that'll do for him, but him being at your four, that's probably the best spot for Avaldi is being a four. This guy is not an ace. He's not a two, maybe a three, depending on what else you've got in that rotation. But if Boston wants to put him at four, even better. It's just going to be a question of, can he take the ball every day? And if you can't, then it doesn't matter whether you put him at four, five, six. It doesn't matter. If you can't make the field, he's he's uh, he's not worth it. So we'll see what Evaldi can do. And then, like I said, Hector Vel uh, Velasquez, I think he'll be the five. We'll talk about him like he's a five. Uh, last year, he had eight starts, one and four record, 548 ERA. Uh, he did work out of the bullpen quite a bit. He actually had 34 appearances. Only eight of those were starts. So he had a lot of work out of the bullpen. Uh, he was one and three as a starter with a 695 ERA. So, I mean, I can see why people would be hesitant to call him the five. But I'm telling you, if you go through the roster, they don't have a lot of other options. And he's the only one that really, you know, went out there and started. And so I think just to give you innings, that's my choice for it. We'll see if they agree. Um, so with that, you know, with the talk of, who else they've got, I did go through, and I like to go, of course, through the MLB pipeline, look at prospects, and see what teams have. For the Boston Red Sox, again, they're not they're not doing a whole lot in the farm system either. They've got two guys, and that's it, in the top 100. 
One of them is first base slash third base, uh, Tristan Casas. He's 20 years old, six foot four, 238 pounds. So he's built like a linebacker, basically. <laughs> throws, uh, bats left handed, throws right handed. Uh, he was actually their 26th overall pick in the 2018 draft. Um, most of 2019, he did spend in the South Atlantic League, where he was with the Greenville Drive. He played in 118 games and hit 254 with 19 homers and 78 RBIs. So how do you judge that? I mean, it's good numbers he hit. He's got power, clearly. But when you're talking that that low-level ball, sometimes it's hard to gauge what would that be in the MLB. What I do think, though, is just because he showed that, um, they'll probably try and get him through the, the minors sooner than later. I mean, I'll, I'll see him moving up to the big leagues this year. But I would say maybe in the next two years, you might see this guy as a call-up. So, and I, I've, I mean, if he's killing it, then sure, they could bring him up this year. But I think that might be a little too soon. But like I say, two years, I could absolutely see them uh, making that move. And then the uh, shortstop they got in the trade was uh, Jeter Downs. He's a um, number 87 in the MLB pipeline ranking, which I forgot to say. Tristan is uh, 85. So they've got number 85 and 87 in the top 100 for prospects. That's what Boston has. Um, he did play shortstop in the minor league system for, of course, the Dodgers last year. He was still with the Dodgers at that point. He played at Rancho Cucamonga, hitting 269, 19 homers, 75 RBIs. He was moved to double-A uh, in just 12 games. He hit 333 with five home runs and 11 RBIs in just 12 games. So now that's something that makes you stand up and, okay, pay attention, because this guy coming up quick. So Jeter Downs, Tristan Casas, we'll see. But I do like Jeter Downs as far as a piece that they got for Mookie Betts when you see kind of what he did and, pro, you know, let's see what he can do. He's probably a future piece that they're thinking about building on. Um, so I, I like the return. I just don't like the return today. But if they got two pieces out of there that will become their future, then sure, people could look back on this trade and, and think completely different of it. But – um, I'm just a little surprised that the Red Sox are settling for not winning during the offseason after the season they had last year. This is not a team that wants to get used to losing again and getting back to that, you know, well, it's been 100 years since we won a World Series. And I'm not saying they will, but after last year, I really thought they would kind of come out and spend some cash. And they're just not doing it. So if we go over the uh, the depth chart with this team uh, real quick, we've already talked about the starters relieving. I don't I don't spend a whole lot of time on relief pitching because it's so you know up and down with like a roller coaster from year to year. You can have the same pl pitchers uh, from one year to the next, but you could have completely different results because that's just the life of the bullpen guys. Um, so we'll start at the closer. Brandon Workman. Workman uh, appeared in 73 games last year for the Red Sox. He had 16 saves, 104 strikeouts in just 71 innings. So he can strike him out. He's been with the Red Sox his entire career, um, but he is now their, their closer. He doesn't have to fight for it. He, that's his job, and I think he'll be fine. My questions more for Workman are, can the Red Sox get him games to save? This season, you know, I don't know. I don't know if I'll have a lot of opportunities to come in and save games. I, I, I really believe that. I mean, they've got some, they do have some offense. The offense is pretty good for the Red Sox. It's the pitching that I just have no faith in whatsoever. So we'll see, see if I'm right or wrong, but that would be my only concern with, uh, with, uh, Workman. So we'll see. Christian Vasquez, uh, so Christian, Appeared in 138 games, which is a career high for him. And uh, he had 276, 23 homers, 72 RBIs. He did miss all of 2015, if you remember, with the Tommy John surgery. And then he missed half of the 2018 season with a broken finger. Is he injury prone? I wouldn't say that yet about him. But 
I mean, just the fact that he's already had two major injuries is at least going to make me think a little bit about if he goes down to an injury this year that, hey, what is this guy's future like? Um, but he's a heck of a player, good bat for a catcher. So I'm a fan. I just I want to see him stay healthy this year and really not have those big, you know, two months out or, hey, rest of the season type injuries because we already talked about it. Ploiecki's not going to save your season if, if, if Vasquez goes down. So we'll see how that works out for them. Um, and then we've got at first base will be Michael Chavis. Chavis is only 24 years old. He did appear in 95 games in 2019 for the Red Sox. Um, he had 254 with 18 home runs and 58 RBIs. But don't forget, in 2018, he was suspended 80 games for performance-enhancing drugs, which he still claims he didn't know that it was, you know, illegal or he didn't knowingly take these, I guess. He's going he's gonna to claim that he didn't know these were a banned substance, which we've heard a million times. And really, from everything I hear with MLB, they make it very clear of what's on the banned list, and they give the, each player, you know, the information about, hey, you can't take these. And it's on the player to then, if they're going to take a supplement, go to that manual and, and see, is it on there? So it doesn't sound like it would be that hard to know whether you're putting something in your body that you shouldn't be. But they still, to this day, claim, you know, ignorance, I guess, to that too. But I, I never tend to buy that. Like, it's it's on you. Like, that's... Whether you knew or you didn't know, I, I would just fess up and just say, look, I served my time, I'm ready to play ball, and leave it at that. I wouldn't go the route of, well, I didn't knowingly do this, I, you know, because we all know MLB makes it very clear of what's a banned substance. So that's on that's on Michael Chavis to, to uh, get busted on something like that. Uh, Jose Peraza, so Peraza, again, I said he came from the Reds. Last year with the Reds, he hit 239, six homers, 33 RBIs in 78 games. Uh, played most of his games at second base, but he also does play third base, shortstop, left field, center field. Maybe this is your Brock Holt replacement. I mean, I think he's going to be the starting second baseman for the Red Sox at this point. But I guess if somebody else comes up, you know, they could, I don't know, I guess Dustin Pedroia probably still has some legs under him. I... I'd hate to do it because I'm a huge Pedroia fan. I love Pedroia, but I don't know what he's got left in his tank. I really don't, you know. So I guess if you want to put Pedroia in that spot, then, yeah, I would say Peraza turns into your Brock Holt, and then that makes sense because he can play anywhere and kind of give Pedroia days off. But I don't know. I don't know how the Boston, you know, Boston fans feel about that. Is Pedroia your, your starting short or second baseman at this point still? I don't know. He's dealt with a lot of injuries, and uh, I'm not sure he can go every day like that. I think, if anything, he might be your backup. And then maybe my favorite player on the Boston Red Sox, third baseman Raphael Devers. This is the legitimate stud on this team, in my opinion. I know a lot of people like J.D. Martinez. I had J.D. Martinez on my Tigers. Great player. But to me, Raphael Devers is the bat on this ball club that makes it tick. Um, last year, and he's only 23, so, I mean, he's got, you know, he's still not in his prime of what's considered the prime of an athlete, especially a baseball player. He's still very young and raw. So this guy, he could get even better. But last year he finished 12th in the MVP voting, which is huge. I mean, that's, at 23, you're already finishing an MVP voting and a, and a team that wasn't that good. And he still got his numbers. Um, hit 308, 54 doubles, 32 RBIs, 115 RBIs. He also passed uh, Budge Hobson for all-time third baseman in Boston Red Sox history for most home runs. Budge Hobson had 30, Devers hit 31. So he passed uh, one of the all-time greats for the Red Sox to uh, in home runs. So I really like Raphael Devers. Uh, Xander Bogart, Xander hit a career high 33 home runs, and for only the second time, or yeah, for only the second time in his career, he hit over 300. So he had a nice season too, and they're really going to need Xander to become more consistent because 
without bet, somebody's got to pick up that slack. And, and Xander, I think, has potential to be even better than he was last year. Um, but the main thing is just consistent. They need him in and out every season, hitting 300, 30 bombs, you know, to really solidify his spot. Um, Andrew Benatendi actually is the one that I saw in an article that basically says, like, hey, I'll take, I'll take what we lost from Mookie Betts, put it on my shoulders. I'll step up my game. They need him to. Uh, he was second on the team in stolen bases last year, was Benatendi, behind Mookie Betts. And they don't have a lot of speedsters on this ball club, so Benatendi's got to use his speed. He does play great defense. Um, it's going to be his fifth season coming in here. And uh, he hit 266, 13 bombs, and 68 ribbies last year for the Red Sox. Not bad, but it, it would be nice if he could if they get a little bit more out of him. You know, 20 homers, maybe 80 RBIs, a little bit better batting average, maybe 280. You know, just step it up a little bit like that, and then you get Xander Bogarts doing his thing again. You're you're still not going to be able to plug in and play somebody that's going to make up for the entire loss of Mookie Betts. You're just not going to do it. That was MVP guy, you know. So you don't just get an MVP and pluck him off a tree and plug him in and play. It doesn't happen. But um, they need better from him. Jackie Bradley Jr., another one. This guy, I've kind of given up on Jackie Bradley. i got to be honest. I like Jackie Bradley. Plays great defense. But his offense is just, it's its not good. It's just not good. And I'm tired of waiting for it. I really thought he would develop at some point. He's not developing. Um, he actually, what, what did he hit last year? Uh, well, for his career, he's a 236 hitter. And he last year he hit 225. So when you're a career 236 hitter and you hit lower than that, it's not good. So he's getting near the Mendoza line. And, and that's not ever a good uh, comparison that you want to be uh, held to there. But he does have some power, 21 homers. But this guy, I think I saw where he takes like 4.3 pitches per at bat. So he's up there hacking. Like he's just he's just making contact. If he makes contact, cool. If he doesn't, he's striking out. And, you know, it's just, it's just not good. So he's definitely a very um, aggressive player with no results, in my opinion. And he's got a glove. So for me, Jackie Bradley should be playing a bench spot somewhere, just kind of, you know, sub it in for giving guys days off in the outfield. That would be how I would use Jackie Bradley. I don't see where his 21 home runs, based on whatever else he's not giving you at key points in the game where he comes up and he takes his four pitches and swings out of his shoes and misses. It's just, I, to me, I'm not a Jackie Bradley fan. And then Alex Verdugo. The right fielder. So this is a guy I didn't know a lot about. I went and did some homework on him. Um, and to my surprise, he could miss opening day with a back injury. And I was like, okay, well, you know, I must have tweaked something. Well, this is a back injury that he suffered last May, dealt with all season, and now he still is dealing with it. So to me, if I'm the Boston Red Sox, I'm a little worried about that because – this is a guy that you, you know, just traded away some really good pieces of your team to get. And he's got back injuries. And anybody that's had a back injury knows that thing can nag for a long time. A long time. So for their sake, I hope it doesn't because the the guy put up numbers. I mean, he, he hit, uh, let me see here. Let me move this over because I want to get you his numbers. Because he absolutely can play. And when you think this guy had lower back injury, um, he still played in 106 games, hit 294, 22 doubles, 12 home runs, and 44 RBIs. That's with a bad back. So, I mean, if this guy can be healthy, he can probably definitely do some damage, you know. So, he'll be an interesting one to see. But I hope he can start opening day. And I'll definitely be interested, just because this is one I admittedly didn't know a lot about, that it sounds like I probably just missed. I mean, clearly, if he's putting up numbers like that, he was playing, he was making, you know, making some some waves in the MLB. 
I just, I was, you know, I claimed ignorant on that one. I didn't know him. Now I do. Now I want to see what he does. And I'm very interested to see how this Boston Red Sox ball club does. And he might have a big part of me being right or wrong about how they finish. And then J.D. Martinez. J.D. Martinez does need a hitter. Um, he did play 15 games in left field last year and 24 in right field, but he's he's a DH. I mean, that's more if they're, you know, interleague and they're in a national, or a, yeah, national league park, he's not DHing, but they can play him in the outfield, and that's fine, and you take Jackie Bradley out. Uh, but he hit 304, 36 home runs, 98 runs scored. Um, 105 RBIs, so just MVP type numbers again from JD Martinez, and I have nothing bad against JD Martinez at all. Nothing. I like JD Martinez. I think he's great. I just like Devers because he's kind of the young up and coming uh, bat that I just always like the young guys that are doing it, and to, just to kind of see is this real? Are they really going to develop? Well, Devers already battling for that MVP award. I don't think it's a matter of is he going to develop. It's my goodness. How much better can he get? Like, he's already at that MVP type level. How much better can this guy get? He could be one of the all time greats. Whereas JD Martinez, I think this is the best we're going to see JD Martinez. Now you're just waiting for the other side of the peak. You know, you, you make it up and then there's always the downfall. So, how long can JD do it? I don't know. It's just nice to see him having success after he left the Tigers and uh, really helping a. a great historic franchise the way he is, but right now he does not have the supporting cast he needs to really do much with that. Um, and that that's pretty much it, folks. Uh, it now brings me to my prediction time. And uh, let me just say, I again, I'm a baseball fan. Yes, I root for the Tigers first and foremost because they're my home team. So I always, I'm one of those people that feel like if that's your home team, whether they're the best team whether they're your favorite players are on there or not, you still root for your home team. You know, my favorite player does not come from the Detroit Tigers. But I still would root for the Detroit Tigers over anybody else because I'm rooting for my home team. So I have no bias in, in this. I love baseball as a whole. Um, you can see I'm wearing a Red Sox hat. I wear different baseball teams all the time. And people are always, oh, you're a Pirates fan? Oh, you're a Brewers fan? No, I'm just a baseball fan. And I, I support everybody. So all my predictions never have any bias in them. I don't hate teams. I don't love teams. I just I just like the sport. So with that being said, I have the Boston Red Sox finishing this season in fourth place, and they're going to finish with a record of 77 and 85. And most of that is the Yankees got better. The Tampa Bay Rays, I think, will be better just by another year, and their young players just getting better. And then I truly believe the Toronto Blue Jays are going to be much better. And again, just from their youth now, kind of getting a season, getting that seasoning in, right? Like just learning the game, learning how to play in the show. And I, I think they're just going to be better. I think the Toronto Blue Jays are absolutely going to surprise some people this year. I don't think they're going to have a chance to pass the Rays and the Yankees, but I do think they're going to put a little few more L's on the on the Boston Red Sox. So, to me, that's how I, I see this uh, panning out. And with that being said, um, that's it. I hope you enjoyed the show. Uh, again, if you were if this, if this is your first time listening, um, I appreciate you coming. Uh, hit the the thumbs up, give me a thumbs up and let me know you liked it. Uh, leave comments, leave questions. I love to, you know, talk with the audience and uh, just maybe hit the bell. You know, if you hit the bell, for those that don't know on YouTube, if you hit the bell, it'll automatically notify you if I release another video. And I plan on releasing videos quite often. I've got a lot of work to still put in, a lot of teams to still cover. Like I say, I talk uh, NB or NWA wrestling. I will have a podcast coming soon. Uh, XFL, I've got a plan for a show very soon if I can make that happen. And um, and then during the NFL season, I do a Detroit Lions podcast. So you know, and then who knows what else is in the works? I could have a lot more coming. I'm just still kind of getting my feet back under me and getting back with this. But I do appreciate all the support, all the kind words. 
Um, you can find us on Facebook. I've got two pages on Facebook. I've got the Heavy Hitter Network, and I've got the Fielder's Choice Podcast. So if you type either one of those into the search bar on Facebook, you will find those. We've got the Heavy Hitter Network YouTube channel. So that's where you would find all these videos. Um, I will be releasing some shows through uh, audio. Um, I don't know how many I'm going to do. We'll, we'll see how this works out. But I'd really like to kind of steer people toward YouTube uh, just to really get all my numbers kind of started on YouTube. And if you've got friends that are baseball fans or just sports fans in general and you think they would enjoy it, I'd much appreciate you passing on a word to them and let them know what we've got going on over here. But, uh, I, I, again, it's been really fun getting back into this. Uh, I got my microphone back, so hopefully the audio is much better on this video than uh, the other two I did. Um, but, yeah, I, I don't know who I'm going to do next. Like I say, I would like to maybe get into the Minnesota Twins. But, again, if you guys want a, a team more than the Twins, then leave it in the comments, and uh, maybe I'll go with the most popular vote for who want, who they want to see next. But for that, I am uh, going to call it a night. This has been Mario Romanelli for the Heavy Hitter Network, and I am out. You know what time it is. Marvin Devine. Hoover. Axel. And you know how we do <laughs> yeah, I got the juice, yeah, I got the juice We game cool, make them look like cool Yeah, I got the juice, yeah, I got the juice. We game cool, make them look like cool.